Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Map Round Show. This is the Secrets of Scale series where we're talking to entrepreneurs and founders all about the art of scaling companies. And with me on the line from the bright lights of California is none other than the man, the legend, Larry Augustin. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Matt. I'm excited to be here. And thank when you. When last were you introduced as a legend? Ah, <laughs> uh, it's been a long time, you know. I don't know if that's good or bad. It makes me start to sound a little bit long in the tooth there. So, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. great to be here. Great yeah, to be it's here. all great, man. Well, you're doing amazing. Well, you have done incredible things when it comes to scaling companies. So why don't you do that now? Like, give us the elevator pitch, Larry, and fill our audience in around the world about what you've achieved in the in the context of scaling companies. So I've been lucky enough to be involved with a lot of great, great companies in my career. My first business that I that I launched was a company called VA Linux, which is in the Linux systems business. Uh, brought that company from scratch. We were doing over $240 million a year in revenue. Uh, brought that company public in 99. Still hold the record for the largest first day gain ever in an IPO. Uh, we grew fast. That company was doubling revenue almost quarter to quarter. And, and just the, the amount you learn from having to scale a business at that speed, just, just phenomenal. Uh, post that, I spent some time as an angel investor, really working with entrepreneurs. I love doing that. Had the opportunity to be involved with some great, great businesses there. Companies like, uh, uh, you know, if you remember the, the, the Java container space, you know, JBoss, uh, Pentaho, great, great BI company, uh, great companies there. Uh, I uh, built a company, uh, came in, joined it as CEO, helped build a company called Sugar CRM, which I took from just over 10 million to just over 100 million. Uh, we sold that firm off to private equity. Uh, and then uh, I've been lucky enough to spend some time over at AWS. So I worked for Andy Jassy, running uh, over a dozen businesses at AWS, primarily in the application space, and got to see a, a multi billion dollar operation really at scale with AWS. So just just lucky enough to be involved in some great, great things in my career. Um, so, I mean, how, what is, I mean, I, there's another, a lot of uh, startups that follow the show and they're, you know, we've been following the world of venture capital. We've been following the world of scale. We've been talking to uh, CEOs and founders who, who've achieved these, you know, sorts of milestones or accolades that many other startup founders are aspiring to. They're on the Silicon Valley train, uh, so to speak. They're on the narrative, you know, build a great product, find a big problem, raise some money, you know, raise more money and go after that problem as fast as possible. Hopefully do an IPO or, you know, have some kind of liquidity event. This is the the mindset that uh, this particular series appeals to. When does it happen? Like, what is there a secret ingredient in this? Because, you know, when I speak to VCs, the, the kind of general formulaic approach in terms of like when they cut a check or not, is usually the same story. Big problem, you know, good product, traction from at a business model perspective, but most importantly, a great team. You know, and so they they may forego. Matt, they, Matt, you, Matt, you just hit all the hit all the bases. I don't know what you need me here for. No, <laughs> just, <laughs> right, we done. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, but I, but I mean, like you've been on both sides, and I think that's what that's what I'm curious about, especially you know in terms of unpacking what you because you you do you see you are sitting on both sides. Um, it, it, it's you, it's it, it's fun to sort of see on sit on both yeah. sides and. Because you, you see people who really do it well. And then you see places where, oh, God, I just wish you guys could get this figured out. And th- th- there's a couple of things that I see. And, and, you know, I don't know that any of this is, is really magic. There's a lot of, you know, hard work, deep commitment, uh, sweat. Uh, uh, I'll probably start there, by the way. I got a whole, whole set of these things that I think about. But um, when I think about, when we were starting, say VA Linux, right? Which is a company I built from zero to you know two forty million public, big IPO. Uh, uh, there were plenty of nights when I was sleeping on the floor under my desk, right? It, it, it's just the 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 time and effort and the hours and just being all in. It's something that I think really makes a difference. And and if you think about great people, you know, great people have to be all in. To make a difference. This isn't, it isn't a side project. 
you know, something a, a venture investor never wants to see is someone's working at their current job. You know, they're spending a couple hours in the evening working on something and they haven't gone all in. You know, it's go all in. I, 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 my credit cards were maxed out. You know, just, just, to, just to give you a sense of what it means to be all in. Credit cards were maxed out, sleeping under the desk. You know, you, you, you've got to be really deep into the business because you're, the energy that you bring to it, that's a big differentiator. Big businesses don't have that. Big businesses have people that work nine to five, right? And that's, and that's, you know, that's how they think about the business. As an entrepreneur, building your own business, you're all in. You know, so you have that kind of energy. That's one thing to think about. Um, another thing to think about here, and, and, and I mention it because I see it all too often when I talk to, to people building businesses and startups, is just think big. You know, uh, uh, we often say it's, you know, building a business is hard. It's just as hard to build a small business as it is to build a big business. So build a big business, put all that effort into something that becomes big. And that means think big. What does it mean you know, in, in the Linux world, Linus Torvalds used to talk about world domination, you know, and, and that was kind of the, the, the catchphrase for thinking about what does it mean for this to be really big? Um, you know, uh, uh, people sometimes say, well, I want a billion dollar valuation. How about a billion dollars in, in revenue? That's, that's really what big thinking means. The valuation will come. Think about lots of users, lots of people, lots of customers. What does it mean to do that? And that means you have to be thinking about problems that people really care about. There have to be a lot of them. Uh, but there's so many things that come from thinking about it being big. Uh, uh, you'll see this. This will show up in a couple of ways. You know, people will see a problem and they'll build something that should be a feature of an existing product. Well, that's limited to an add-on to an existing product. That's, that's kind of limiting your scope. Or they build something, they build a great product, but they don't know where that product sort of can get big in the broader world and the sense of, okay, I'm solving a bigger problem than just that product. And you kind of get this one product business. And again, you, you know, you can have a fine little business here, but it's not really thinking big. So how do you think about, you know, we have multiple products and multiple features across all of those products and you're solving a big problem. Now it doesn't mean you start there, right? Cause you got to start focused and you got to grow into this, but, but think big. I don't know. Those are those are a couple of things that I think uh, influence the success that you see in great companies. Mm. Thinking big is a is an is a philosophy. I actually have a custom license plate up my stairs from the basement for my kids because they're starting to read and shit. So I'm trying to like you know implant this idea about like think big, and it literally says you know think big Colorado, like a like, custom license plate thing on one of the <laughs> stairs. Um, and so I very much subscribe to what you're saying. Um, however, I, I, just from experience, I've learned that some founders don't do scale well. Like they, they're actually not, they don't have the skill set to do it or they raise a lot of money and then the business does start scaling. But then for whatever reason, you know, like they don't, the, the board or the investors, they, they replace them. And I think the stat was, 50% of you know venture backed startups replace this this the founder you know and he and I literally spoke to a guy yesterday um, I won't mention who it is but basically you know founder CEO 20 year old company took PE money and the private equity uh, team are like look we're going to you know you must not become chairman <laughs> and yeah, we're going to put a yeah. CEO in who can actually get us a return on our capital so I think this is and not in all cases you do find cases where you know founders are able to scale to the extent that the company does but in the but I mean the half of the time it doesn't if not more than that um, and so for me, I, I guess uh, where I'm trying to go with this, Larry, is like you, you have to actually know what type of founder you are because sometimes, you, you know, an, another conversation I had this morning on a, on a different series, but the guy was saying he scaled his company, woke up one morning and he was like, this sucks. I don't like scale. <laughs> I like the idea of scale, but in reality, I, I actually don't like it. I'm, it doesn't make me happy. Yeah, no, look, you, you absolutely have to decide what type of founder you are. And there are plenty of great stories where a founder has brought in a business partner, someone who knows how to operate and scale the business, and that's a great, great relationship. There are also many, many great stories where that founder has stayed in that CEO seat. 
and grown up. And, and you have to have a commitment to doing that. And uh, what you do as the CEO of a you know, $100 million, 500 person company or, or a billion dollar, you know, 5,000 person company is very, very different than what you do as the, you know, I do everything as the, you know, head of a 10 person company. It's very different. And and you have to be willing to change with that and adjust and, and learn along the way. One of the things that I always did that, that I think helped me was uh, uh, I hired people that I could learn from. I, I used to say that if I'm going to hire someone to do a job, I want them to do it better than I can. That, that's the point, right? Well, you know, why would I hire you if I can do the job that well? And some people I don't think necessarily think that way, right? They think, you know, I'm going to hire someone to teach them to do the job. Well, when you're trying to scale as a founder and CEO, you know, you want people who uh, you can learn from. And uh, uh, there's another saying here, if you look around the room and you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Okay. Make sure that you are hiring great people that you can learn from and they will help you. They will help you grow into that role. They will help you understand how what you did when you were a 10 person company is very different than how you spend your time, you know, as a 5,000 person company. Um, and, and don't be afraid of that and, and let them help you with that, you know, get some great help there. The other thing I would tell people, um, I don't think enough people do this, which is get a coach. Um, I've always uh, had coaches in my career. I had mentors and coaches. I, I've hired people to to sort of help me understand how I'm doing my job in the business, what the team needs, what the company needs, what am I missing? Uh, uh, that's a good, uh, you know, athletes have coaches. It's why you should have that as an executive. So, you know, that's another way to think about how you can scale. Mm. How do you reconcile, uh, you know, there's uh, sometimes I just don't, I don't think it's a good idea to, to give your mind questions that it cannot answer relatively easily, you know. So, for example, like, what is my purpose in life? Or, you know, you know, it's like, like I don't know, what is it, a set of car keys that I leave it lying around in the basement somewhere? <laughs> Um, and so I ask founders on the series, uh, you know, and uh, CEOs of like Series D, massively mature companies. I'm like, how much scale is enough? Like, how do you figure that out? Because it's an interesting one, right? Because I think I do believe, and I wrote about this in my book, that there is a Silicon Valley narrative that it's start a business, you know, do lots of focus groups, pivot, 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 find a product market fit, then you raise money. You know, know mm -hmm. your unit economic scale, 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 raise, 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 and then you sell it. And that, that, that's the startup narrative, isn't it? Um, and then when I spoke to Bo Burlingham, who literally wrote the book, uh, Finish Big and Small Giants, uh, you know, where he spoke to founders who've been on that train and then sold and went to like epic amounts of depression, <laughs> like after exiting. Cause that, you know, cause it's kind of like, what, well, it's what hard. You your whole, your whole life is tied up in that. Oh, totally. If you have, if you have done what I, what I suggested here, which is you are all in at that, that is your world. And then when it's gone, that's a tough path. That's a really tough path. Cause now you're trying to figure mm. out, well, what do I do? Next, where do I go from there? So I I I, I get that. Um, there's this tension that often happens in companies between investors and founders about the exit process, and uh, I actually often see it go the other way from what you described, which is the the investors want to get money out. And I remind founder of this: when you took money as an investor, that wasn't a permanent check. You know, they wrote it because they want more money back later, right? That's the, that's the deal, you know? And so at some point they're going to come along and say, Hey, you know, we gave you this money, you know, three, five, 10 years ago, it's time that we found a way to get our money back out and they will push for that sale for that exit. Right. Um, and I think you as a founder have to understand 
okay, what are the dynamics with your investors? Uh, what type of investor do you have there? Do they are they the type that that wants to be in this long term? Are they a type that says, "Hey, I've got a three year, you know, return profile," and you're going to have to figure that out? Um, and then, how does that fit with with what you want to do with the business? I, there's, there's great businesses that that you can keep going with, and um, don't sell too soon. In that, I know there's this this temptation, but great businesses find a way. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking about one particular business. There was um, ServiceNow, so there, there's a great great story about how when ServiceNow was very early, they got a very good acquisition offer in the few hundred million dollar range, and everyone was sitting around the table going, wow, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're all going to make, uh, uh, you know, five X our money. Uh, founders here are going to make some good return. You know, we should do this. And, uh, one of the, one of the investors, uh, who's a very, very senior, well-respected Silicon Valley sort of threw himself in the, uh, in front of this. Okay. And said, you guys are missing the opportunity. It was sort of over my dead body. Are you going to sell this thing too soon? This is going to be a multi-billion dollar company. Don't sell yourself short. And it was right, you know, and, and went and became that great big business. So, you know, think about those things. Don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't get to that exit too fast. Um, uh, and make sure you understand where your investors want to be and, and what you want out of it. Yeah, and I, and I think that last point is really key, right? What you want out of it, because um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's important to know what you're getting into. Because I've I've bootstrapped companies, I've raised money, and let me tell you, I've learned very quickly that I actually hate having a number over my head. <laughs> it's like I have a just I have an existential problem with the authority, and so it feels like well, I have a board. It's like no, <laughs> like that. Doesn't... I tell you what I see. What I see in great companies, great founders, is they're they're, they're actually not hugely you know, number target focused. They are focused on a great business, something that adds value to customers and that's solving real problems. And I, I may be being a little too dramatic in that because they usually have, you know, a good sense of controls and operations, but that's not what drives them. You know, they're not passionate about growing ARR by, you know, 30%. You know, that's not the passion. The passion is solving the problem in the best way, in a great way, such that customers are really excited. And you do that, the the the, the metrics, you know, the the the, the company comes, right? It, it it happens from that. So uh uh you need to be you need to be deep and passionate about it. Mm. Um, Larry, what would you say has been your greatest achievement in the context of scale? Was it the initial IPO story or is it what you've done since then? Oh, greatest achievement in scale. Um, uh, you know, the businesses I ran at AWS were, were clearly the largest, largest in scale. Um, I was very proud of taking a, a business in Sugar CRM and, and growing in that, in that growth. Uh, you know, I'd say clearly the the if you look at just the doing it for the first time, I, you know, nothing really compares with that doing it for the first time, and and that um, rocket ship uh, of the first time. So I, I I you know I guess in spite of the other things, I kind of go back to that first experience where it was my completely my own thing, and um, uh, the scaling was very rapid. And, uh, you know, I look back and, you know, talk about, you know, naive and just figuring out what I'm doing. Uh, uh, I like learning. There's well, something great about learning <laughs> and all of that, too. So I, I guess I kind of go back to that. All right. Um, quickly, I want to talk to you about AI. Uh, so obviously, we were chatting before we went live about Otis. Uh, it seems to me like AI was always a lip service thing for the previous sort of 10 years. And now, as of Thanksgiving last year, it was like, oh, snap, like AI isn't crap. <laughs> um, and seems to me like pretty much, I think I was chatting to another VC GP 
um, uh, last week, and he was saying that 70% of the startups in YC this year are like all AI. So AI and ap- applications and so on and so forth. How, how important is this event uh, in the context so it, of yeah. companies now? Yeah, a- AI, of course, is the current hot buzzword. You can't do anything without talking about AI now. And, and you know, everyone is all over that, that problem. Um, uh, I, I'm going to preface this a little bit with the, the there's a lot of people out now out there now that are slapping a layer on top of chat GPT. Mm. And it's really easy to do that. And that is so cool because it 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 lets you get something out there really fast. And people are inventing all sorts of new things right on top of that. I think uh, uh, like eight of the top 10, you know, GitHub projects have all rocketed to the top that are some layer on uh, chat GPT. Uh, that's not a sustainable business. Right. That is that is there's not enough differentiation there. There are cool ideas, but that is not a place to go and create a great next company. OK, um, I, I kind of put that out in front of people because a lot of people are, are run into things like that. It, it's it, yeah, you can use it. But remember, it's one tool. Build build a great business across multiple things. Um, uh, that said, you know, uh, generative AI has reached the point where we are at a complete uh, existential threat to existing kinds of businesses. And it is a fundamental change akin to the Internet. So uh, I have been talking about some of these AI concepts for years, the concept that I call AI native. And we've really kind of reached that cliff, that turning point with the current generation of large language models. So, so my concept of AI native is this, and, and uh, again, I'll go back to the early days of SaaS and cloud businesses. When, when it became apparent that we could run applications in the cloud and people could access that via, via the browser, the, the sort of first generation of that was to take existing applications and lift and shift them to the cloud. Now, that, that gave people the benefit that, hey, I, I don't have to run this anymore. Someone else runs it. Someone else takes care of it. I don't have to be in all of that business of maintenance and support. I can get to it from anywhere. I get it in the web browser. That's great. But that generation didn't really take advantage of other benefits that came from being a shared multi-tenant application sitting out in the cloud. We developed this idea of cloud native which is you know, an application that was really built for that architecture. And once you're built for that architecture and you go multi-tenant and you can share data, uh, uh, at least access and visibility to data across customers, and you can use that to better understand your business and scale, and you understand how people are using your product better, suddenly you get this great acceleration and cloud native surpasses the lift and shift. We're at that point today with, with AI. And I've been talking about this concept of AI native, and, and we haven't quite been there. Uh, I'll say we're there now, which is the first generation of AI apps were apps that set alongside what you already did. They probably pulled data out, and then they gave you some advice about what to do. Good thing to start, great place, useful. But we're now at the point where that whole app is going to be rethought. The way you use it is going to be rethought. And think about this. The AI is going to be the one at the core doing most of the grunt work. And the advisor, the person managing it, is is you. So so the the user is now more in the manager guidance check role versus where they are today, which is they're in the role of doing things with the AI suggesting them. That flip where you go, and, and and by the way, that goes going with that is going to be a fundamental architecture change inside these applications, where the machine learning algorithm is going to be at the center. And what we often have today, that structured database with tables and fields, that's that that thing is going to sit to the side because that's the that that's the side reporting or the side analysis that goes with it. The core is going to be that. AI that's helping 
and actually doing the work, that's going to sit at the center. So we're going to see the, this complete restructure of these, these kinds of apps. I mean, I, I'll give you a specific example uh, that I think people might relate to, which is um, an app that I use all the time is Grammarly. I love Grammarly. It sits on the side of my, you know, sits on the side of Word and it advises me. But if you think about the ability now of these LLMs to actually write and write good prose, the way I use ChatGPT is I'm giving you guidance. I'm telling it, you know, here are the things that I, that I want you to write about, that I care about. Uh, here's my view on something. You write it. And then when it comes back, you read that, you go, okay, but you got this wrong. Do this, make this change. You're not editing anymore. You are the, uh, uh, you're not editing in the sense that you're marking it up. You're telling it what you want. I often tell, uh, you know, I'll sometimes tell people, yeah, think of chat GPT as your employee. You know, it's your, uh, 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 it's your intern. You know, you wanted to do it. So, so the way you write completely changes. Mm. That's the kind of change in how people work that is that this generative AI is bringing. It's, it's, it's just big changes in how you do things. Yeah, I, I actually think that GPT, even though it's just generative copy at the moment and maybe with some code and stuff like that, I actually think it's an amazing co-founder. Um, because like I, so I was, I just, you know, started chatting to it about this idea of influence. Right. And I just kept going deeper. I was like deeper, deeper. And then it would give me like an output. And then I'd say, cool. So on six, cause now it's talking about shit that's way above my pay grade. Like you said, you know, if you're not the, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Like with GPT-4, you're always not the smartest person. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, and that, and that shit's going to stay the same and get more mature. So, uh, so I actually think GPT is, is, it's your CMO, it's your co-founder. And anyway, so I was going down this rabbit hole and I was starting to talk about algorithms and audit assessment. I'm like, hang on, wait, this is now starting to be CTO stuff. And then I'm like, cool. So now I said, expand on that and, and produce a table and a, an algorithm that we can then use to build an app. And it then produces all that stuff. And then I'm like, cool, start writing the app. And then it starts spitting out a Python uh, script. I don't know how the fuck Python works, but it does, you know. (laughs) And I know that if I had an investor, you know, behind me and I knew that, you know, I was able to package a pitch or whatever, like I could get to a level of scale with a really amazingly insightful application that was based on truth, or a breadth of information and a depth of information that would allow me to create a better product faster out of the gate. And, yes. And without having the, the, all the knowledge around, you know, how to create Python applications that are open and integrated. And, but it could give you a blueprint for a, for a product literally within a few minutes. Um, and so for me, at least in the context of scale, especially first-time founders or founders just starting with nothing, to have GPT as your go-to co-founder is a really powerful idea. That, that's a really, I, I like that. That's, that's a uh, really insightful and powerful idea that you just walked through. It, it, it can be there. You can ask it these questions. You can feed it information. Uh, uh, you can help ask it how to do things. You can have it do things for you. It, it, it's, you know, I mentioned uh, at one point the idea of scaling uh, and, uh, you know, you have to scale employees. It, 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 it's like that employee for you. It, it helps you get more done. Uh, very insightful. I, I like that view of it. I like that view of it. Mm. I just don't know what to do after it starts spitting out Python scripts because then I'm like, shit, now I actually need a co-founder <laughs> because this is the other thing. I was like, I was like, but well, what? I write, but you know, look, I, I started my career writing code. So, oh, okay. you know, uh, so, I, I, so. but I'm not, I don't write code all the time anymore. Mm. So I'm not, the, the it takes me time now, mm. you know, I'm not as immediately versatile in the syntax. I, when I write code now, I ask chat JPT to write it for me and I bring it over and I understand it, but it's just, it, it, it is so much faster for me to tell it what I want it to write and to bring it over than for me to kind of stumble through the syntax 
you know, just being a person who doesn't do it mm. 24 by 7 anymore. Mm. Right? I, yeah, absolutely. And I think, but it's not quite where it needs to be because I'm like, great, I've got this code. I want it to now create an actual web app that is compiled and then I want to go deploy to the web. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's like the next evolution of it. I think I'm excited about that because it will allow us to get past this awkward survival, don't really know what to build for who for, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And and I think it's not quite where it is yet. It's just generative copy. But when we could generatively create web applications and integrate with these 10 APIs and then to your point, Larry, like actually get it to conversely do things truly to create value uh, fast so that we can then say, hey, Mr. Investor, Larry Augustin or whoever, you know, give me a hundred grand. Here's the working prototype. Here's the business case for it. Here's some early, like whatever. Like I'm able to, to start to, the scaling process way, way faster. Uh, but yes. I just felt like we're just falling a little bit flat on the last hurdle for me. But you can see, you can see, you know, if you go back a year, you know, it, a year ago, it didn't feel like we were close enough that you could see that next yeah. phase, right? Totally. Yeah. And and when they really when they push this stuff out there, it's like, oh wow, you know, you've got so much. It does so much. Now we just need to connect the last pieces and pull it all together. So I think you're completely right. Someone's going to figure that out. They're going to tie this into the point where where I have an idea for for a web app. I'm going to be able to walk chat gpt through it and you know it may not be chat gpt but you know a gpt4 or a large language model that gets this that is connected on the back end and you're going to get a prototype we, we're you can see it now you know it's just we're, we're kind of in the uh uh it's far enough along that if you're looking down the highway you know you can see where the road needs to go we got to build it still but we're far enough along we can see the end. It's, it's going to happen now. Mm. How much? So let's maybe future pace this, right? So let's say that, uh, who knows? Let's just say it's in a year from now. It's entirely probable. Like I know um, Adam Oliner from Graft, and he's creating this platform of pre-trained AI libraries that a founder entrepreneur can come along to and literally drag and drop. You know, I'll connect you to them if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, so like you can drag and drop these libraries of pre-trained so you don't have to find the data you don't have to train you don't have to have the expertise so what they're doing is they're enabling democratized access to ai true application uh, application okay. ai okay it's amazing okay right? so then so let's say that this all happens and that any founder anywhere in the world now has access to pre-trained libraries and actually gpt is just something that used to happen it was cool for a while but now we're, we're now in this mature ecosystem right where we can create applications at speed and start scaling things faster uh, than ever before so assuming that it's now democratized how much of a strategic differentiator is ai going to be at that point because it seems to me that when anything is you know dematerialized and democratized and so on and so forth it's uh, peter diamandis isn't it so now we, if we yeah if well think well th yeah. think about this i was giving the analogy to cloud native Okay, right, right. is the fact that your application is SaaS and run the cloud differentiation enough? No, not anymore. Right, it's the same thing here. You know, it, 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 AI is going to be an important component of every application. That we are, we will get to that point. But in and of itself, it's not sufficient differentiation. It, it's it's not going to. Is not going to separate you because the person next to you can do it too. Just like the, 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 you know, I have a great app. I put it in the cloud. If, if the fact that you're in the cloud is the only thing special about you, that's not enough. We're going to see the same thing here. Mm. So where do you think the opportunity is then if we future pace the same conversation where democratized access to AI is truly there and you can create a web app in literally an hour, assuming that we get there. In the context of scale, where's the secret going to lie, would you say? Is it in the team? Is it in the vision and the execution? Where would you say the rubber hits the road then in terms of scale? Well, uh, there's a couple things. In, ter in, in terms of scale, right, you know, the, the, you, you still have to figure out how to bring that thing out, get customers, go to markets, do all of those things. And 
This is something that I have been uh, pushing on startups now for a long time. The technology is just getting easier. Every few years, we can recreate something that was built, you know, a few years ago. And guess what? It takes us half the time to rebuild it. And it probably runs, you know, probably costs us half to run it. So it's cheaper, faster, better. The technology is advancing so fast that people can now create these fantastic applications and recreate things, uh, you know, of a few years ago, easily, cheaply, quickly. Okay. So it, it, when you, when you're in this world where the technology is becoming uh, easier to replicate so quickly, then uh, the key for startups really becomes how do I find customers? And, and uh, I used to do this graph where I would look at the cost to build a technology versus the cost to sell a technology. And it's the cost to go to market that's really kind of growing through the roof for most of the companies. And this is kind of odd. I'm a technologist by training, you know, and, and uh, uh, so I, I tend to think about what it, the product is and what it does in building great products. But it's gotten, it just keeps getting easier and easier and easier to build the product. It, it's actually getting harder and harder and harder to figure out how to sell and go to market. Hmm. So, uh, when, when you think about that part of the business and how you scale, you've got to be thinking about how do we go to market? How do we get customers? How do we find customers? There's a concept here that I uh, often talk about. It's um, go to market built in, which is, you, know, you, you see this in a lot of, a lot of great product founders, right? They, they come in, they create a great product and then they kind of walk in with the product and say, okay, now we need to go sell it. Like, well, uh, congratulations. That's actually the harder part of the problem. <laughs> you solve the easy part. <laughs> you solve the easy part. Okay. Mm. And, and if from the beginning you say, okay, we have this great product idea, but how are we going to find people? How are we going to get it in the hands of people and enable that to grow rapidly and scale? And if you have a plan for that from the beginning, you'll often actually change the product to support that. So, you know, uh, uh, freemium kinds of models are a great example of that. It, you know, is it a product where I can have a bottoms up sales motion? People will try, you know, they get started and then they buy. Uh, 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 having, you know, you, you have to have some concept of how you're going to get unfair advantage and go to market. Think of that at the beginning, feed that into your product design, you will be just way, way ahead than it, when it comes to the question of how do I scale this? Mm. Because you will have you will have built your product to support the scaling method. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that's such a powerful po point. I mean, I've been running uh, this private placement perspective series talking to GPs, and I said, listen, you know, how many of your portfolio actually meet their projections? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, and, and then I and then I put this thing out on Twitter where it's this guy. It's like this animation, but it's a guy that's walking into a crowd of people and they're just avoiding him like the plague. And I'm like, you know, this is exactly like startups post race trying to meet their projections. Um, and uh, you know, there's the joke of the first board meeting past the investment. Yeah. You know, it's the oh shit board meeting. You oh, know, because you it, yeah, it is. You know, it's the first <laughs> board meeting past the but guess what? We didn't hit any of the numbers we told you. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. when we took the money, but. You know, it, 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 it's okay. You know, everyone, everyone expects that sort of now, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. You got to take your projections or their projections, divide that by five, take their costs, double that by two, and <laughs> then you kind of in the reality world. <laughs> there you go. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So Larry, what is your advice to a founder listening, us, listening to us or watching us somewhere in the world today about scaling a company? Is there something that you believe truly that, or maybe a you know a conventional, an unconventional idea that you that you know to be true that the world doesn't know about? Is there something interesting or insightful there that you'd like to depart to our audience? That the world doesn't know about? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's a silver bullet out there. Mm. Uh, I'll tell you that. Okay, I don't know if there's a silver bullet out there. Um, uh, I think when you are figuring out how to scale up 
a business, you really have to think about the team and the people and how you get leverage on your time, how you get leverage on where you spend your effort and how you, you make things easy there. Um, uh, here, here's a piece of advice that, that I often find uh, people need in this space, which is uh, you have to make the, in order to scale, the idea has to be simple because it has to be repeated and replicable and it ha- that has to happen across lots of people. Uh, as you hire people, the idea of what they do has to be simple. As you find more and more customers, the idea of what the problem you solve for them has to be simple. Most founders are very smart. Smart people are happy with complexity. That complexity doesn't scale. That's a, you know, a, a, a rule for you there, which is think about how you simplify what you do so that you can have thousands of employees, you can explain it to thousands of customers. Uh, there, there's a, a concept we used to use, which was the, the idea of you get the back of your business card. That's the amount of space you have. You have to describe your business, explain why someone should care in the you know two sentences of room you get on the back of a business card. If you can't, then you're not going to scale because you 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 can't explain it to employees simply enough. You can't explain it to investors simply enough. You can't explain it to customers simply enough because you're going to have to do that a lot. And uh, just think about it as the, the more complex that explanation is, the fewer people you can teach it to. And that doesn't scale. So, so you've got to f- figure out how to simplify what you do and explain what it is. Mm. It's a hard thing to do, right? And I suppose that's the challenge. It's a very hard thing to do. And part of the reason it's hard is that founders, these people are very smart and they're comfortable with complexity. Mm. And they're comfortable with the idea that, that, you know, you don't understand my business and, and it takes a half hour for me to explain why my business solves this big complicated problem. And, that that may absolutely be true, and that is, um, uh, but that is the downs. That is the weakness of, you know, that intelligent, smart person. You have to figure out. You have to learn to abstract that out, and simplify it. Um, I know I've, you know, simplification. Just if you get that right, that helps you scale so much faster. Mm. It's hard for visionaries to do that, though, because they're always looking at the new shiny thing. I'm guilty of it's that. It's very too. hard. Yeah. It's very hard. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no disagreement there. It's it, it's a hard thing to do, but you've got to be able to to um, repeat at scale and teach at scale and explain at scale what you do. That only happens if it's simple. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Larry, uh, let's wrap this up. Why do you do what you do? You, you've obviously achieved a lot more than 99% of the most of the other founders out there. Um, you know, you don't have to be getting out of bed in the morning necessarily, you know, but uh, what does get you out of bed in the morning? Why do you do what you do? I, I, I guess I'd say I'm kind of a builder at heart. You know, I, I, I'm an engineer. I learned to be an engineer. You know, we used to say, uh, you know, the difference between engineers and scientists you know, scientists study what is. Engineers create what has never been. Mm. There you go. That's our uh, <laughs> Nailed it. our little jab. Our little jab on the scientists. Um, uh, but what I like about that is it's about creating and building things. And uh, I do what I do because I get to work with really fun, exciting people with great ideas who are building things. And I and I love that process of building things. You know, and and uh, figuring out an org chart for a company is is, you know, it's like writing a piece of code. It's, it's figuring out how to get this done, how to make it work, how to create things. So I, I, I love doing that. I, I, I love the smart people I get to spend time with. Um, you know, I, I want to look around the room and, and realize I can learn from the people that I'm with. And, and part, of the re- part of the way I find those is, you know, great entrepreneurs. Um, I want, uh, I, I love that experience and, and it excites me. Mm. well larry thank you so much for being on the show brother i appreciate you for coming on um i know you have a lot going on 
Uh, but uh, I think your perspectives are, are unique. I mean, being on both sides, having IPO'd, scaled companies, you invest in companies, you've had amazing success on both sides. So thank you for being here and for making a difference. Well, thanks, Matt. Really exciting. Uh, anytime. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Anytime. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all again soon. Ciao. Thank you.